Welcome this evening uh, to this session. <clears throat> what I'd like to share with you this evening um, is really to delve into the data a little bit more in detail in regards to the AIR-2 trial. As Dr. Cox mentioned, this therapy, this novel therapy, has really been investigated extensively uh, across a number of trials. And a summary of this is depicted here. As you'll note here, um, the first trials that Dr. Cox referred to that he led uh, started back in, um, in, and were published in, in the early, um, in the mid-2000s. And you can see that um, uh, the patients that have been enrolled in these studies have continued uh, follow-up, as uh, Dr. Cox mentioned, um, and that's depicted in the gray here. The subsequent trials, the AIR trial and the RESA trial, um, added to that experience in that uh, in those trials, uh, the patients that were enrolled in those trials had more severe asthma, and in particular, the RESA trial, they had very severe asthma. Um, and a significant proportion of those patients uh, were on oral corticosteroids. What we're going to be talking about next is the uh, results of the AIR-2 trial, which is the largest uh, trial done of a respiratory medical device in asthma, uh, where 190 patients were treated uh, across 30 sites. Um, and as mentioned, these patients continue to be followed up um, out here in this time frame so that we capture at least five years' worth of data after they've received uh, the bronchial thermoplasty. So as a result of this cumulative experience now, um, almost 300 patients have been studied uh, in controlled trials. Um, and this results in over 800 procedures being performed with bronchial thermoplasty. And as we can mention at the end, um, there are a number now patients that have been enrolled clinically and treated clinically, um, now over 100 patients uh, in the US. Um, and so the, the experience, the, the amount of patients that have been treated with this uh, treatment have uh, continued to accumulate. So the AIR-2 trial was a pivotal trial that led to its uh, approval by the FDA. And as I'll stress here, these patients were symptomatic uh, despite taking high doses of inhaled steroids and long-acting beta agonist. In this trial, in particular the AIR-2 trial, uh, we chose the asthma quality of life questionnaire as a patient-centered outcome. Um, and this was in discussion with the FDA and what would be the primary endpoint. And this was a validated standard asthma outcome. It was um, felt to be a, a good um, uh, primary outcome for this particular trial. In this particular trial, we took great pains to carefully control the trial by enrolling patients um, in a sham controlled uh, trial. So for every three patients that were enrolled, two would receive active treatment with bronchial thermoplasty here in this arm, and then one out of those three patients would receive a sham bronchoscopy. This sham bronchoscopy um, occurred um, in the same location, in the same area, with the same device uh, in the room. Uh, the bronchoscopist introduced the catheter, just like Dr. Cox uh, mentioned. Um, and the catheter itself, uh, the, the device was activated. The lights would go on, the, you know, the sound of the activation. But there would be no energy delivered across those contact points. Um, and so there was a lot of detail uh, put to, to make sure that the patients uh, did not know what treatment they received um, in terms of blinding. There was also a separate team that did all the assessments. So there was a treatment team and then there was an assessment team uh, that captured the endpoints that we'll be discussing next. Um, so this trial was conducted uh, across 30 sites, almost 300 subjects in six uh, countries were enrolled. Uh, for the primary endpoint, uh, it was at one year. Um, and then we've continued to follow these patients out uh, to five years uh, for safety reasons. And we've recently completed some of these five-year follow-ups uh, at our site in St. Louis. Now, these are the patient demographics that were enrolled in the AIR-2 trial. Uh, you can see, again, 190 patients received the active treatment, 98 in the sham group. And you can see that this really parallels what one would describe as a severe asthma population in the U.S., where there is a predominance of females um, and, again, a, a predominance of, of whites uh, in this population. Now, in terms of their asthma uh, characteristics, these are depicted here. Uh, you can see that their lung function was mildly reduced in these patients. 
They required high doses of inhaled corticosteroids. These are almost uh, 2,000 micrograms of beclomethasone equivalents uh, per day. And you'll note here their asthma quality of life uh, score, which was, again, the primary endpoint, um, which is on a scale of 1 to 7, 7 being very good quality of life, 1 being severely impaired quality of life. Uh, these patients, uh, on average, were around 4.3, uh, which, if you compare to other severe asthma trials, is quite impaired. It's one of the lowest I've seen. Um, in that these patients are, were significantly impaired in terms of their lung disease. And that's also um, corroborated by their symptom-free days. You can see there are only 16 to 17% of their days uh, do they uh, not have symptoms from their asthma. And their concomitant therapy, I'll note down at the, at the bottom. So these are a summary of the primary uh, endpoints of the trial, as well as the secondary and other endpoints from the trial. Um, and if one looks at the primary endpoint, uh, the appropriate way to interpret the change in quality of life is to look at their minimally important difference uh, in the quality of life score. The minimally important difference has been set at 0.5, uh, based upon this being uh, 0.5 being a clinically important change in, in this patient's status. You'll note here that 79% of the patients, or almost four out of five patients, achieve that MID of, of 0.5. Um, and this effect persisted out to, to one year. Um, this corresponds to, in the sham group, there were 64% of those patients that achieved that MID, which certainly was greater than one expected with a sham bronchoscopy, uh, but still significantly, uh, there was a statistically significant difference between these two groups. That is an important outcome, but also equally important is to consider uh, the other outcomes that were noted in this trial a 32% decrease in severe exacerbations. These are severe exacerbations requiring oral steroids or a doubling their inhaled steroid dose, so the latter category was a, a very small percentage. Um, so this is quite important for our patients where um, there were a third um, decrease in their severe exacerbations requiring oral steroids. A striking 84% reduction in emergency room visits uh, a 73% reduction in hospitalizations and a 66% um, uh, reduction in lost days from work or school. And there was no unanticipated events. And this is graphically demonstrated here. And you'll note here those that are statistically significant are, are starred here, and the statistics are noted up here in the top right-hand corner. Importantly, these uh, outcomes are demonstrated from the post-treatment period. So we had pre-specified that around the treatments, uh, around the three bronchothermoplasty treatments, that that would be considered the treatment period. And then after that, third treatment, one would enter into what's called the post-treatment period. And this um, then is followed out to one year. So in the post-treatment period, again, there was a significant reduction in, in severe exacerbations, 32%, and a significant reduction in, in emergency room visits. You'll note here that there is not a statistical significance assigned to the reduction in hospitalizations. And that's because there was one outlier here in, in the control group, in the sham group, that had eight hospitalizations. And because of that outlier, uh, we cannot apply statistics uh, uh, to, to that potentially uh, endpoint. Now, what I'm going to share with you next is uh, some recent data that was uh, published in the Annals of Allergy, uh, Asthma, and Immunology, which addresses uh, a key question of how long does this effect last? And that's noted here uh, in this table, where you'll note that these are the proportion of patients that experience severe exacerbations, emergency room visits, and hospitalizations. This is the year prior to the study entry, one year, which again corresponds to the primary endpoints uh, of the trial, or the uh, key endpoints from the, the primary trial. And now the new data, which is two years out uh, from their original treatment. And you'll note here that in comparison to the year prior in terms of severe exacerbations, again, at one year, there was a significant reduction in severe exacerbations at 30% uh, experiencing a severe exacerbation. And now two years out from their treatment, it's at 23%. This proportion is, is not significantly different uh, at year one uh, or year two in comparison to year one. Um, and uh, if you look at the rate of exacerbations, that was also not significantly uh, different between these two groups, which means that there really was no uptick or no change in their exacerbations that occurred after that one-year time period. Similar results are seen for emergency room visits here at 
uh, hospitalizations at 3% uh, out to two years. Uh, and again, the rates, uh, if one looks at it as a rate, again, those uh, results were uh, significant, uh, not significantly different between the one year and the two year uh, results. Um, you'll note that there is no control group here because of the, the way the ER2 trial was set up at one year. We decided not to continue the blind for the entire five years, and so the blind was broken and the control group was told, um, both pa group of patients were told what they had received. Um, and so the control group did not contribute to, to this data. So in summary, in terms of safety um, from the uh, trials that we've described to date, uh, there have been over 850 bronchoscopies in these control trials. There have been no uh, major events uh, uh, such as death, pneumothorax, or ventilation, or airway stenosis, or narrowing. Um, there is a definite increase in respiratory events that occur around the time of the treatment, during that treatment period. And so typically what it is, it's a worsening of your, that patient's asthma. Um, and this is uh, typically incurs with uh, increase in shortness of breath, chest tightness, and wheezing. It responds to bronchodilators, and it responds to systemic corticosteroids. Um, and typically this occurs within a day of the treatment and each treatment. Uh, and resolves within a, a week of the, of the therapy that we give to them. Um, so this is not too unusual for these patient population in that they're quite accustomed to having frequent exacerbations. And this is like a typical exacerbation uh, for them. Now in the post-treatment period, what we noted was a lot of these events started to reverse. And in fact, there were less respiratory as, uh, adverse events. There were less asthma symptoms reported in this group and as we noted earlier, less uh, emergency room visits and hospitalizations in the post-treatment period. Now let's look at that in a little bit more detail in terms of the hospitalizations. You'll note that the hospitalizations that occurred um, were approximately 10% uh, in comparison to the sham group of 2% here. And you'll note that that's per subject. If you look at it per bronchoscopy, it's about 3%. So it's important, again, when you're talking to your patients that um, you would like to refer to have this done, um, that you do talk with them that this may cause a hospitalization, a worsening of their, of their asthma. And in fact, uh, what I tell my patients is that the risk of that is about 3 to 4% per treatment. And then over the three bronchoscopies, it's approximately about 9 to 10%. Um, and again, that's something that each patient has to make a personal decision about, uh, together with you as their physician, um, in terms of balancing the uh, benefits that one sees from bronchothermoplasty uh, with this adverse events uh, that occur. What happens during those hospitalizations, you'll note here the vast majority of them was basically aggravation of their asthma. Um, there were a few cases of atelectasis, which is likely related to the mucus uh, that's uh, produced during the treatment. Uh, and you'll note here uh, one uh, case, unfortunately, that uh, did not have uh, adequate uh, uh, preoperative uh, preparation. So in terms of safety, if one looks even uh, farther out to, to the two years, again, um, really nothing unexpected uh, in terms of uh, the bronchial thermoplasty group. Um, there's really uh, not been anything that uh, has been uh, unexpected. Their lung function has remained stable now at one year and two years. Um, and as Dr. Cox mentioned, in addition in this study, also a subset, uh, 100 patients uh, that received the bronchothermoplasty and 50 of the control subjects that have had uh, CT scans um, throughout the, the treatment period, so at one year, three, and five years. And that allows us uh, to evaluate those. Those are being reviewed in a blinded fashion by a, a pulmonologist and radiologist. Um, independent of kind of what their treatment status is. Um, and this was um, 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 demonstrated at a previous uh, uh, ATS meeting where there was really no evidence of any structural changes occurring uh, even at one year uh, in regards to this, uh, the CT changes. So um, like Dr. Cox, uh, it's always um, good to kind of talk about your own patients. And this is one of my patients. Um, uh, that uh, demonstrated a significant benefit from bronchothermoplasty. And this patient uh, was a young patient, 27, um, who was quite active uh, during her college years, uh, participated in a number of sports. Um, and um, during that time period, she developed severe asthma. Um, and at the point that I had seen her, 
Um, she was already on Adver 500, uh, taking that twice daily. She was using her beta agonist two to three times per day, and she really only had a very few days that were symptom-free. Um, she had a kind of a sentinel event where she had to go to the emergency room with a severe uh, exacerbation uh, and was put on corticosteroids, and she had two prior um, unscheduled office visits uh, prior to the procedure. Um, she had a number of days that she had missed from work. Again, she was quite active uh, in that regard. And so this resulted in terms of her quality of life uh, uh, being a significant impairment of her quality of life. Um, her examination it was uh, as noted here. Her lung function uh, was preserved. Um, and you'll note that um, um, not all patients with severe asthma necessarily have a reduced uh, FMV1 as demonstrated in this particular case. Her outcome short term uh, is that she did have an increase in coughing and wheezing immediately after each procedure. This resolved within one to two days. Um, and now two years uh, out uh, from a procedure, she has had no severe exacerbations um, or visits to the emergency room. And she's reduced her inhaler use to about two to three times uh, per week. In fact, now we've uh, completed her four-year follow-up uh, with similar results. Um, she's resumed uh, her sports activities, now has run uh, two half uh, marathons, uh, which is quite remarkable. Her and her husband now have become quite active. Um, and in fact, she just uh, had a baby uh, in the last uh, few months. So uh, we congratulate her, and she had a wonderful outcome in terms of the, the bronchial thermoplasty.